Hello, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Tahir Jalil. I'm a second year medical student. Uh, our lecture today is going to be about liver metabolism and disease. Uh, it's a very short and quite interesting lecture, so inshallah we'll have fun. If you guys have any question, you have my contacts here. You can contact me at any time. So in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the functions of the liver and uh, hepatic circulation. Uh, and then we'll also talk about bilirubin metabolism and excretion. And finally, we'll talk about jaundice and its different types. So let's talk about the functions of the liver. Well, the liver is one of the most important organs in the body and it has so many functions. So let's start this thing then. The first one is that it's a reservoir for blood. What does that mean? It means that the liver, you know, they have sinusoids. And these sinusoids can store so much blood. Uh, from the liver, 25% of the cardiac output goes to the liver. So you can imagine how much blood flows through it each day. And it has the capacity, these sinusoids in the liver have the capacity to expand and store blood whenever needed. And it can also contract and expand, uh, expel blood to the circulation whenever needed. Okay, and That's a very important function, and we'll discuss why in a minute. Uh, also, one of the main functions is the uh, metabolism of macromolecules. Uh, this is a function that is usually not mentioned, but it's a very important. Uh, it's a very important function. When uh, macromolecules are digested in the intestines and then reabsorbed by the body into the portal circulation, it goes back to the liver, and then that's where it, where they get metabolized and used for energy. So for example, if you eat a fatty meal. Uh, you'll take this fat, it will be digested in the stomach and the intestines and then reabsorbed in the small intestine. And then where will it go? It will go to the liver and that's where you can use it uh, to get energy, okay? So it's one of, it's the, it's the main source of energy for the body, okay? Another function is that it detoxifies alcohol, drugs, and st steroidal hormones. Um, so uh, whenever you... you take any drugs or any medications, uh, it gets metabolized in the liver. It gets detoxified in the liver. And detoxif detoxification usually means that it becomes solubilized in order for it to be able to get excreted. You don't want anything to build up in your body. If anything, if any drug or any or alcohol or even hormones, they stay in your body for a long time, you're going to cause a lot of uh, issues. So you need to detoxify them by making them more soluble. Uh, for them to get excreted, and that happens in the liver. Okay, another function is the production of triglycerides and storage, oops, of storage of glucose uh, of glycogen. Uh, so, uh, in the liver, uh, the, the glucose it's absorbed in the liver and stored as glycogen, and then glycogen is converted into glucose whenever needed. That's also the case for triglycerides or fats. They're stored in the liver, and then they get. Uh, uh, they get broken down into fatty acids and glycerol whenever needed for energy, okay? Another function of the liver is bile synthesis, and we spoke this about, uh, we spoke about this in the lecture yesterday. Uh, so now we know that the liver is the site of, of synthesis of bile, and we know why bile is important for the uh, digestion and reabsorption of fat. Then it's also the site of storage of vitamins, uh, vitamin A, D, E, and K. Okay, and all of those are very important vitamins. Uh, so if you if the liver function is uh is not it, it, if the liver is not functioning well, you won't have stores of any of these vitamins, and those it's going to cause many many problems. And it's another function is protein metabolism and production. So all the proteins or most of the proteins in the body are produced in the liver like albumin, which is very important in uh, in controlling the hydrostatic pressure and the osmolarity of the blood of the plasma or blood. Uh, also the bleeding factors or the clotting factors, and they're also produced in the liver. So if the liver function is not functioning well, if the liver is not functioning well, you have many bleeding disorders. And finally, uh, detoxification of ammonia, and we'll talk about this later in the in the lecture
So you can see, and I'm sure there are many, many other functions of the liver that aren't mentioned here, but those are the main ones. So you can see how important the liver is and uh, why when the liver fails, basically the body fails, okay? So we'll talk about each of these or like most of these in detail, starting with reservoir of blood, okay? So the first thing we need to know is that the liver has two uh, dual circulation. It has two sources of blood, okay? It has... Uh, blood coming from the hepatic artery, oxygenated blood, and it also has blood coming from the portal venous system from all the GI organs, okay? So all the GI organs are give out portal veins, which join to, to be a big portal vein, and then uh, they enter the liver, the liver as deoxygenated blood, okay? And then all of these uh, join to form sinusoids, and the sinusoids drain into the inferior vena cava, okay? So the liver has a dual blood supply, oxygenated blood from the hepatic artery, as we said, which comes from the aorta, and deoxygenated blood from the portal venous system uh, from all the GI organs. And this is how reabsorption to the liver happens from the small intestine and other organs, okay? It acts as a reservoir of blood, as we said, which means that it can expand and store blood uh, as, uh, as the body needs. So for example, during heart failure, the heart is not pumping any blood. That means that the circulation is compromised, okay? And uh, because of that, there will be a huge buildup of blood in the in the body, okay? In the in the venous system in the body, because the heart, the blood isn't circulating. Now we don't want that because that will lead to edema, many other things. We don't want so much blood to be in the venous system. So, so what does the liver do? The sinusoids in the liver expand in order to store more blood. The sinusoids in the liver expand in order to store more blood, just to take away some of the blood from the circulation to prevent the building up of blood too much in the circulation. Okay. And for example, let's say we have hemorrhage, a huge hemorrhage, and there's a huge source of bleeding from the uh from the body. What does the liver do? It contracts to uh, to expel the blood that it already has stored in it. It contracts to expel that blood into the circulation because now the body needs the extra blood. It, ne it needs as many blood, uh, as much blood as it can get. So some of this blood that's stored in the liver gets expelled by the contraction of the liver into the blood during hemorrhage, okay? So we now know why this function is so important. Uh, another thing we have to keep in mind that portal and hepatic artery flow increases during meals because there is more reabsorption. Uh, there is uh, the liver functions more because it needs to metabolize more things, and that's why the blood supply or the the flow in the portal and hepatic system increases during meals. Okay, all clear until now. Yes. Now, let's revise some histology. Uh, in the liver, we have something called the portal triad over here, and it forms from portal vein and center. And on the sides, we have the hepatic artery and the uh, biliary ducts, or the biliary duct tubes. Sorry. Now, one thing uh, we have to know for this lecture are these zones. I'm sure you took them in other lectures as well, but let's revise them, uh, revise them quickly. We have this zone, zone one, we call the peripheral zone. Okay, and it's the furthest away from the central uh, or the central sinusoid. Okay, now this zone has the highest oxygen saturation. Why? Because the hepatic artery is, uh, or the hepatic artery is giving its arteriole right at this level. Okay, so it's the zone with the highest oxygen saturation, and because it's the zone with the highest oxygen saturation, this is the site of oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so this uh, these hepatocytes in zone one. They produce energy by oxidative phosphorylation. And these also, this zone also contains the Kupffer cells or the macrophages of the liver for immunity, because you, the macrophages can intercept, can intercept things as soon as they come in. Okay, that's why they're in zone one. So let's understand these instead of memorizing them, and it becomes much easier. And now gluconeogenesis is a very energy consuming uh, a process, and that's why it also happens in the hepatocytes in zone one because we have high oxygen saturation, okay? Now, zone three, uh, on the other hand, is the furthest away from the arteriole, and so it has the lowest oxygen saturation, sorry? And that's why, what type of metabolism will it have? 
anaerobic glycolysis. And uh, its main function is detoxification or solubilizing of everything. Okay. So these things you have to remember that zone one, meta uh, the metabolism in zone one is by oxidative phosphorylation since it has the highest oxygen saturation. It, it contains the copper cells and it's this uh, site of gluconeogenesis. Well, zone three, which uh, we also call the pre uh, pericentral zone, just around the center, is where anaerobic glycolysis takes place, and it's the site of detoxification. Okay. Now, one thing we need to note is that because zone three has the lowest oxygen saturation, it is the most sensitive zone to ischemia or ischemic injuries. Ischemia, if you guys don't know what ischemia means, it's low perfusion to the organ. If we have low blood flow to the organ and low oxygen flow to the organ, uh, the most sensitive uh, part will be uh, zone three. Okay, and therefore what function will be affected the most? Detoxification. So because this uh, zone receives the least oxygen anyway, if there's already ischemic injury and low oxygen perfusion to the, to the organ, this zone will be at highest risk of ischemic injury and the most sensitive. All clear until now? Yes. Okay. Now let's talk about a very important concept, portal hypertension. Okay. So once these enter, okay, they all join to form the central sinusoid. Okay. Now the central sinusoid has uh uh, has a mixture of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, and then the sinusoids go and flow into the central vein. Okay, now what's the lymphatic system of the liver? The lymphatic system uh, is basically we have these spaces between the sinusoids and the hepatocytes. Okay, and this is the interstitium of the liver, and we call it the space of this of this thing, whatever you want to call it. Okay, now when fluid and protein they they go into the space of this A or this. Uh, the fluid flows into these lymphatic vessels and then they're taken up by the lymphatic system. Okay. And one thing you need to note about these sinusoids it, is that they are fenestrated and they have many holes in them. So they allow for uh, protein and uh, water. Any they allow protein and water to live easily. Okay. Uh now, when these proteins and uh, when when this protein and water leaves, it will just get pulled by the lymphatic vessels. Now, sometimes, so this, as we said, this is the lymphatic drainage system. Sometimes, the fluid that leaves from here is too much for this for the lymphatic vessels to keep up. So, where does it go? It goes between the hepatocytes, goes outside from the capsule, and accumulates in the abdomen. Okay, so what do we call accumulation of fluid in the abdomen? Anyone know? Ascites, excellent. Okay, so okay. And one case where we'll have this excessive uh, secretion of water over here in the interstitium is portal hypertension. The blood pressure in the portal vein is too much, and that increases the hydrostatic pressure in the sinusoid which will expel water uh, excessively into the space of uh, this and lymphatic vessels won't be able to keep up. The fluid will just leave through uh, the capsule and accumulate in the abdomen. This condition we call ascites. Okay, so one of the symptoms of portal hypertension is ascites and now we know how it happens. All clear until now? Yes, now portal sir. hypertension. Portal hypertension has many symptoms and uh, why, why, is, why is that? Because the portal system affords many anastomoses in different parts of the GI system, okay? So one of these anastomoses is around the esophagus, okay? These, these are all portal veins. And, uh, when, when we have portal hypertension, these small portal venules, they expand Okay, and they dilate and they form what we call varices, okay, esophageal varices. And once the one if these varices burst, they will obviously uh, cause expulsion of blood in the esophagus, and that will lead to vomiting of blood, okay, which we call hematemesis. 
Okay, so one of the symptoms of portal hypertension is hemithemesis. Another site of anastomosis is uh, over here around the umbilicus. Okay, and if these dilate, you'll have a circle of dilated veins around the umbil umbilicus, and that we call caput med medusa. Okay, so that's another symptom of portal hypertension. Another anastomosis is around the rectal area, and if these veins they dilate, we, we call them hemorrhoids. Okay. Uh, and uh, the patient may present with blood and feces. And finally, because one of the major uh, one of the major contributors to the portal system is the spleen, if there is hypertension in the portal system, blood will back back up into the spleen, and the veins will dilate over here, causing splenomegaly. Okay. So the main this, the main ones are ascites and splenomegaly, because you can see them right away. Uh, but remember those two. Because those aren't important only for this lecture, though they're, they're also important in an anatomy lecture. So you need to remember those five very well. Okay, ascites. We know why because of the failure of the lymphatic system to keep up with the hydrostatic with the high hydrostatic pressure in the sinusoids. Esophageal varices causing hematemesis, splenomegaly because of the backup of blood into the spleen. Caput medusa because of uh, the anastomosis around the umbilicus. And finally, hemorrhoids because of the anastomosis around the rectal area. All clear until now? Yes. Okay. Now let's talk about different types of cells in the hepatic system or in the, in the liver. First of all, we have hepatocytes, the most obvious one. And these cells are responsible mainly for metabolism. Every type and all the types of metabolism, whether it was detoxification, uh, glucose formation, glycogen formation, whatever, all of that happens in the hepatocytes. They're also responsible for the secretion of bile as we discussed in the previous lecture. And finally, uh, this is a feature and not a function, okay? Just to differentiate between feature and function, this is a feature of hepatocytes. We have a very high ability to regenerate. If you take uh, out 75% of the liver, uh, it's it has the ability to regenerate to full. Okay, so it has a very high ability to re regenerate. This is a feature of hepatocytes. Another types of uh, another type of cells we can see uh, are copper cells, and these are just macrophages that reside in the uh, in the liver, uh, just for immunity. Okay, and which zone does do the copper cells lie in? Where can we find them? Zone one, two, or three. Zone one, excellent, okay? Now, another type of cell is the uh, stellate cells, okay? These stellate cells, they're, be they're in the interstitium and they're basically the fibroblasts of the liver, okay? And fibroblasts and or myofibroblasts, they usually secrete collagen for repair, okay? So this cell is responsible for repair by two, by two methods. One is that they produce collagen if there's damage to the liver, they produce collagen to make a scar in the uh, in the liver, and that's how cirrhosis happens. Cirrhosis is constant damage to the liver due to toxicity, whether it was alcohol or any other other cause of toxicity to the liver. Cell damage happens, and then these stellate cells in the interstitium they produce collagen, which uh, forms the scars in the liver uh, or uh, and and lead to fibrosis. Okay. And cirrhosis is actually one of the main causes of portal hypertension. So we can link these two causes together. Another way it helps repair the, uh, the liver is that it secretes uh, HGF, which is hepatic growth factor. Okay, and from the name, it's uh, a growth factor for the liver. And in case it was damaged, these this growth growth factor helps uh, in mitosis of the hepatocytes and uh, repair of the liver, okay? So stellate cells is the, the main function is repair. It's also the site of storage of vitamin A. You remember in the beginning of the lecture, we said many vitamins are stored in the liver. So vitamin A is stored in stellate cells. And so if stellate cells, if you have any problem with the stellate cells, first of all, the repair of the liver will be, uh, it, it will not function well. And vitamin, you'll have problems with vitamin A, okay? Now, the last types of uh, last type of cells we have are endothelial cells. These are the cells that surround the capillary. 
the capillaries. As we said, they're fenestrated and they allow uh, for proteins and water to, to go through. Okay, all clear until now? Yes. Move on. Oops. So this should say bilirubin metabolism and excretions. So bilirubin metabolism is very simple. Okay. So what is bilirubin? So bilirubin is the it's what heme is converted to. Okay. If we want to get rid of heme, we convert it into bilirubin. Okay. And it's a colored pigment. So anything that has color in the body that gets excreted from the body. Usually, bilirubin is part of the urine, feces, okay? Um, so, what happens is that when once hemoglobin is released from the RBCs, the heme from the hemoglobin, of the red blood cells, gets converted into biliverdin, okay? And this happens in the reticuloendothelial system in the spleen, okay? So, all of this happens in the, in the spleen, okay? Macrophages of the spleen, they get the dead or senes uh, senescent RBCs, okay? They, these burst in the spleen, okay? And they release heme. Now this heme is converted into biliverdin, which is a green pigment. And then this biliverdin is converted into bilirubin. All of this happens where? In the spleen, okay? In the macrophageal spleen. Now, it's unconjugated bilirubin. Unconjugated means it's less soluble uh, and we can conjugate it by adding uh, glucuronate or glucuronic acid, and this happens in the liver. Okay, so if I ask you where where is bilirubin synthesized or made, that's in the spleen, in the macrophages of the spleen, but then it gets conjugated in the liver. Okay, so this is very important to understand. Many people get confused and think bilirubin is made in the liver. It's not. It's conjugated in the liver. Okay, so heme is changed into biliverdin and then bilirubin in macrophages in the spleen. This is unconjugated bilirubin. And then it's then conjugated in the liver by adding glucuronic acid. And the enzyme that does this is called glucuronosyl transferase. It's not very important to remember the name of the enzyme. Pretty simple anyway. Okay, so it transfers glucuronate into the uh, bilir unconjugated bilirubin. All clear till now? Simple, I think. Now, once the, this bilirubin is synthesized, the uh, conjugated bilirubin, we need to excrete it inside. So how is that done? You see over here, bilirubin glucuronide, which means it's now conjugated. So it goes with the bile, and it's actually the pigment that gives bile its, its green color, okay, bilirubin. Now, uh, bilirubin, it goes to the gut, and then it gets fer uh, fermented by bacteria. Again, just like bile, it gets fermented by bacteria. Fermentation, we said in the previous lecture, means the conjugation. So so it gets deconjugated by the by the bacteria in the gut, okay, into something we call or a pigment we call urobilonogen. Okay. Now this, so conjugated bilirubin is deconjugated in the small intestine and forms urobilinogen. Okay. Now this can either be reabsorbed into the liver directly, plus reabsorbed, conjugated, and goes back, reabsorbed, conjugated, and then goes back. That's one path it can it can go to. The second path is be oxidized into stercobilin over here and leaves with feces. And this is actually what gives feces its brown color, okay? The stercobilin, okay? Another path for it to go is be oxidized into urobilin and leaves with urine. And this is actually what gives urine its yellow color, okay? So bilirubin excretion in clear. Yes. Clear. Just push the chat. Okay. So now jaundice. This is a very this is the highest yield part of the lecture. Jaundice, what is jaundice? Jaundice is yellow <laughs> discoloration. Can you remove mute, please? So what is jaundice? Jaundice is yellow discoloration of the skin and clear of the eye due to buildup of bilirubin in the blood, okay? So you can see this baby over here is yellow and the eyes of this lady is yellow. This is what we call jaundice, okay? And this is due to buildup of bilirubin in the blood, okay? So logically, it's either too much bilirubin is being synthesized or 
two, uh, bilirubin is not getting excreted well, okay? <clears throat> so those are two reasons that can cause, that can cause buildup of bilirubin in the blood. Now, we have two types of jaundice, either physiological jaundice or pathologic jaundice. Physiological means it's normal. It's normal, and this happens in the neonates. Neonatal jaundice, we call it physiological jaundice, because this is normal. And why does it happen? It's because hepatocytes of neonates are immature. They cannot conjugate bilirubin for it to be excreted. And, uh, and so the neonates, to some extent, have some jaundice over here, you see? Um, another type of jaundice is pathologic pathologic jaundice, and this shouldn't be there, and this is mainly in the adults. So, pathologic jaundice can fall under two under two categories, either unconjugated or conjugated. Okay, another name for unconjugated is prehepatic. So don't memorize this, understand it. Where does conjugation of bilirubin happen in the liver? So, so if it's unconjugated jaundice. And I didn't even reach the liver, the bilirubin, because it's not getting uh, conjugated. Or it reached the liver, but the enzyme in the liver is not working. So, so those are two reasons for unconjugated jaundice or, or prehepatic jaundice. Okay? Another uh, cause is conjugated or post-hepatic. And this means that it passed the liver, got conjugated, but uh, it was, was obstructed on the way through, and so it had to leave to the blood. Okay, and this we also talk, spoke about yesterday in the biliary secretion lecture. If you have uh, gallstones in the common bile duct or in the ampulla, the, the, the bilirubin just builds up there and and leaves to the blood. And that's why it builds up in the blood and causes jaundice. Okay, and this we call post-hepatic or conjugated. So many people get confused between conjugated and unconjugated. This is a very high yield topic for the exam. Uh, whether whether the type of jaundice has unconjugated bilirubin or conjugated bilirubin. Okay. Now, how we test for jaundice? We have we test we test the urobilinogen levels in the urine. This pigment, we test this in the urine. Okay. If it's if it's high, that means we have prehepatic or unconjugated because this. This is on is deconjugated bilirubin. Okay, so if this is high, that means that uh, we have an unconjugated or prehepatic case of uh, of jaundice, and if it's low, then we have obstructive or posthepatic because most of the bilirubin is by now conjugated. So you won't have high levels of deconjugated or unconjugated bilirubin in the urine. Is that clear until now? Yes. Now, hereditary jaundice. Hereditary means from birth. Okay, so sometimes we get we get uh, jaundice due to uh, deficiencies from birth or congenital deficiencies. Okay, so what are examples of this hereditary jaundice? We have something called Gilbert syndrome. Okay, Gilbert Gilbert syndrome. We have mild deficiency in glucuronosyl transferase. We said this is the enzyme that's responsible for conjugation of bilirubin, right? Now, if we have deficiency in this enzyme, you'll get jaundice because, uh, and this, will, will it be conjugated or unconjugated bilirubin? Uh, this will be unconjugated. Excellent, why? Because we have a deficiency in the enzyme that's conjugation. That's conjug conjugating. Okay. So another type is krigler najjar syndrome. And this is complete absence of glucuronous oil transferase. Now, just from this, the first line, what do you think is most is more severe? A najjar or Gilbert? Najjar. Yes, because it's complete absence. And uh, one way to differentiate Aslan between Krigler Najjar and Gilbert syndrome is Krigler Najjar comes from early life, okay, because the enzyme is absent completely. And so it happens in units, and you see the symptoms in units from early on. And so you can remember it like this the N in Najjar stands for neonated. Okay, so you see it's from early on in life, and it's the systems persist, and it may actually be fatal. Okay, so it's it's very severe because 
there's no conjugation whatsoever for a bilirubin. So a bilirubin is not excreted in any way and it stays in the blood, causes chartus. And we'll see why it's fatal in a minute. Now, Gilbert syndrome, because we only have a mild deficiency, uh, it only appears when you're in a state of stress. When the, metabol when the metabolism increases in the body, exercise, stress, physiological or mental stress, uh, you'll have, uh, uh, you need more metabolism. And that's why uh, you'll get jaundice in that time. So a, a, a case, a typical case would be a 45-year-old female was running in the treadmill and then she presented in the ER with jaundice and uh, nausea and whatever and whatever. So now that will be Gilbert syndrome because it's apparent that the the symptoms came later on in her life. She's a, she's an adult. There's no way you can you can you won't detect Najjar from early on. Okay, you're always de detect Najjar from your natal life, but Gilbert is usually often discovered late in life, and it only happens in a stressful situation. Uh, and Krigler Najjar would present as uh, a two week old and baby uh, had extreme jaundice. Okay, because we discussed that it's normal for babies to have jaundice, right? neonatal jaundice. We discussed that it's uh, it's normal, but if it persists for a long time, that means we have something wrong. And this is probably this Krigler Najjar syndrome. Okay. Now, the last one you need to know is called Dublin Johnson. And this is a deficiency in liver excretion. Okay, and this is just benign. It won't cause many uh, symptoms, but the thing you'll see is dark. Okay, uh, and will this be conjugated or unconjugated? Bilirubin? Conjugated since it's a deficiency in the liver excretion. Excellent, because the uh, bilirubin is already conjugated, but we just can't be excreted. Then it's the, the bilirubin you'll find is conjugated. Now, I'll ask you guys a question. What do you think is more dangerous, unconjugated bilirubin or conjugated bilirubin? Uh, unconjugated. Why? Um, because from what I've seen, like in these uh, hereditary dundas, that un, uh, unconjugated bilirubin can cause death later on. This, uh, like for example, in Dublin Johnson, conjugated just like it's benign, and any for example, dark liver. But I don't think it can then cause death. Do you know why it causes death, or it can cause death? Okay, so let's see why. So it's because of condition we call pernictins. Okay, so basically, what happens is that unconjugated bilirubin can cross the blood-brain barrier. Conjugated cannot, okay? Unconjugated bilirubin can cross the blood-brain barrier. Once it crosses the blood-brain barrier, it can accumulate in the brain, causing permanent brain damage, okay? So this is why unconjugated bilirubin is much worse than conjugated bilirubin. No matter how much the conjugated bilirubin gets like high in the body, uh, it can get excreted. So it's not that big of a deal and it won't deposit anywhere in the body. However, unconjugated bilirubin is harder to excrete, and also it's it, it builds up in the brain, so that's why it's very dangerous. And when when uh, unconjugated bilirubin causes uh, irreversible damage to the brain, we call this condition connectives. Okay, so for neonates, we use phototherapy to isomerize the unconjugated bilirubin and make it more soluble. So. We said that neonatal jaundice is normal, right? Right, But if this neonatal jaundice persists for a certain amount of time and is also severe, then that means something is wrong and you need to solve this jaundice immediately, okay? Before it causes kernicterus, very time sensitive. Well, and the way we do this is literally phototherapy, okay? We, uh, uh, we put the babies under UV light, and this UV light isomerizes the bilirubin from unconjugated and makes it more soluble. And so it can get excreted more easily, and it won't be able to cross the blood brain barrier. Okay? So this is like the earlier you catch uh, jaundice, abnormal jaundice in babies, uh, the better the life, uh, the survival chance. Okay? 
Now, the last disease we need to talk about is hepatic encephalo encephalopathy. Okay, let's break down the name, hepatic liver. Encephalo means brain, pathy means something wrong. Okay, so how does the liver cause encephalopathy? Simply, one of the functions we said at the beginning of the lecture is detoxification of ammonia. We also said that detoxification means making something more soluble in order for it to be excreted. Now, ammonia is a very toxic molecule. Why? So usually when it comes to the liver, it's converted into the into urea using the urea cycle. And I think you guys took this in mole too. If not, you'll take it soon. Uh, so ammonia is converted into urea in the urea cycle in the liver, and urea will get excreted in the urine. However, if the liver is not functioning, Ammonia will build up in the blood because it, it's not converted into anything that can be secreted easily or excreted easily. So it will build up in the blood. And then where does it go? It will go and cross the blood brain barrier. Okay. Once it enters the brain, it has a strong osmotic force or as strong osmotic pressure. It will pull water inside the brain. And once it pulls water inside the brain, it will cause brain edema. And brain edema can cause many things okay but we're not concerned with that right now just uh you have you guys have to know that uh the fish uh, uh, uh problem with the liver function can lead to brain edema and this is the route of how it does it ammonia which is usually converted into urea and excreted can no longer be converted into urea and so it builds up in the blood and uh and goes to the brain enters the brain crosses the blood brain barrier pulls water with it and causes edema all clear until now. Yes. Okay, so last thing. Uh, markers for liver pathology. So how do we know that there's liver damage? We have many markers or many enzymes we can test in the blood to know if the liver is damaged or not. ALT and AST, those are enzymes usually found inside the liver. So once there is liver toxicity or liver damage and the hepatocytes are dying, these enzymes will be uh, secreted into the blood, okay? And if there's high levels of these enzymes, that means that we have liver damage or liver cell death, okay? Alanine transferase and aspartate transferase, okay? Now, for another marker is ALP, alkaline phosphatase. But this is not very specific for the liver because we can we can find this high also if there is a muscle or a bone, I mean bone deficiency or bone disease. Okay. Finally, we have gamma glutamyl transpeptidase. And this is very specific for biliary obstruction. So if we have gallstones or anything obstructing the biliary uh, system, like a tumor or or we have cirrhosis or whatever, anything obstructing the biliary, biliary system or biliary trees. Uh, will have high levels of beta, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase in the blood. So this is how we know that there's a liver pathology. See? Yes. So that's it for the lecture. Thank you guys so much for attending. Anyone have any questions? No, very clear. Please scan the code and...